Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Gathering. It's good to have you in worship with us today. My name is Matt Miofsky, and I especially want to welcome all of you who listen online. I know so many of you check us out uh, each and every week, whether you live here in St. Louis or somewhere else uh, around the country. We're really grateful to have you worship with us online. Uh, We have a lot of traditions in my family, as I'm sure you do around the holidays. And one of those is, uh, as a family, we all love to sit down at some point and watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the movie. For the rare person who hasn't, the premise is pretty simple. The patriarch of the family, Clark W. Griswold, is trying to manufacture the perfect holiday for his family. So he has in his head, right, this ideal image of what Christmas ought to be. He has this picture of how things ought to turn out. And the entire movie is, is, is his mission to try to make that kind of Christmas for his family. Of course, you already know what happens, right? Nothing turns out as he envisions. From the very opening scene where he forgets the saw to go cut down the Christmas tree, things just go downhill. The lights that he spends countless hours working on won't come on. When it's time to go do the shopping, he gets locked in the attic. When the families show up, they immediately start bickering. Then some families show up that he didn't expect to show up. His cousin Eddie uh, gets him fired from his job. And the whole movie really ends with, with his entire house being destroyed. I mean, Christmas couldn't have panned out to be more different from the image that he had in his head. And the more he tried to control and manufacture that perfect Christmas, the worse things got. And the result, of course, is funny. I mean, it's funny for us who watching it. It's funny to see someone who is so, <laughs> so trying to control things. He's trying so hard to make something happen, and then it just doesn't happen. It's funny when it's happening to somebody else. It's not so funny when it's actually happening to you. I had my own mini experience of this uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Another one of our traditions is, you know, we we always get a tree and, and we pick a night, usually Thanksgiving weekend, where we get all the kids and we decorate the tree, hang the lights, and we get out ornaments. And the ornaments are from my childhood, all throughout the years we get ornaments as gifts. And Here's how it goes in my head. We, we build a fire. We all sit around the tree. We get the ornaments out. We laugh. We remember things. We talk. We listen to Christmas music. We decorate the tree. It's a lovely evening. Now, here's the way that it actually turned out. We had to force the kids who really weren't that into it to get into the you know, living room. We couldn't cut the tree down at our normal Christmas tree farm because they were running low, so I had to go to Lowe's to buy it. We put on Christmas music and started getting ornaments out, and immediately kids started bickering with one another. Ornaments started breaking. We had to constantly get them off their devices. Finally, after an hour of Jess and I sort of forcing them to hang a few ornaments on the tree, we let them scatter, and and Jess and I just did the remaining decorations ourselves. It was slightly frustrating, not the picture of decorating the tree that I had in my head, but that's what actually happened. (laughs) Now, that's my story, but I'm sure all of you have a a story of of the same kind of thing, where you have in your head this image of how things are supposed to be, but but as much as you um, picture it, as much as you try to make that happen, things don't go the way that you expect. And and that can can leave us frustrated, it can leave us anxious, it can leave us dissatisfied, it can even leave us cynical. It's hard when we realize that despite our best intentions, we can't create or control or manufacture the Christmas that we sometimes have in our head. It can frustrate us, but it doesn't have to. Today, we we heard a word from another song in the Gospel of Luke that addresses, I think, amongst other things, our desire to control and manufacture the perfect Christmas. If you listened in last week, I, I read part of this same song that we heard at the beginning of this sermon. The song is from a a man in the New Testament named Zechariah. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. And when he finds out that um, his own son is going to be born in order to uh, herald the way for Jesus, the Son of God, Scripture says that Zechariah breaks forth in a song. 
in which he praises God for the the coming of Jesus. And let me read to you just two verses in which Zechariah is praising God for Jesus. And listen to what Zechariah thinks Jesus is bringing. It says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Zechariah says, Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us in the path of peace. That word peace is a, a word that Uh, you can't help but notice if you read the Bible at all. Peace is probably the word most associated with the birth of Jesus. It's most associated with the Christmas story. In fact, even before Jesus is born, uh, that word peace is associated with the Messiah. If you go all the way back in the Old Testament to the, the prophet Isaiah, some 600, 700 years before Jesus is ever born, Isaiah prophesies about the birth of the Messiah, and he says this. This comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He says, A child is born to us, a son given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. When Jesus is is actually born, if you remember, the angels appear to the shepherds and they say this. They say, glory to God in heaven and on earth peace amongst those whom he favors. Peace wasn't just something that the prophets talked about or that Zechariah saw coming or that the angels declared. But even after Jesus grows up, that word peace constantly appears in his life. When Jesus heals people, he often dismisses them by saying, go in peace. On the night before he dies, when he's sitting with his disciples, Jesus says, it's my peace that I'm going to to leave with you. After Jesus' resurrection, when he appears to his disciples, he says, peace be with you. Over and over again, peace is part of Jesus' story from before he was born to when he was born to even after his death. And so if peace is part of Jesus' story, it's worth asking, what is peace? What is this peace that Jesus is supposed to bring? Now, for a lot of Israelites, for a lot of the people in Jesus' time or even before that, peace meant something out there. Peace was economic peace or political peace or militaristic peace. Peace meant uh, things being the way that they were supposed to, to be. And peace certainly is that. In part, it's about God's ultimate plan to make things right in our world. But if you read the the Bible closely, it also seems like peace is something more than that. It's something closer uh, than that. It's something maybe more personal. I remember once I got a chance to hear uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu preach. Some of you know who that is. He was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. He was the Archbishop in apartheid South Africa. He worked tirelessly for justice and peace in that country. But when I heard him preach, it it wasn't uh, those big prospects of peace that he was talking about when it comes to war, violence, or injustice. But instead, he began his sermon by saying something that always stuck with me. He said, if we are ever to to accomplish a peace out there, we have to start by finding the peace that comes in here. And And he pointed at his chest. That if peace is ever going to exist out there, he said, it first has to begin in here. When we talk about peace, especially in the Bible, I think that that while we could talk about peace on a large scale, it's this internal kind of, of peace that we really need to talk about. It's this kind of peace that I think a lot of us need this Christmas. If you study the word in the Bible, most of the time when Jesus talks about peace, he's talking about something that happens inside us. It's something personal and internal. Paul writes about this kind of internal peace, that internal calm, when he says this in Philippians. Listen, this is Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. He says, Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. 
Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. See, for Paul, there's a relationship between Jesus being near and our ability to experience peace even if things around us are chaotic and messy. Last year, one of my New Year's resolutions was I was finally going to write a book. And a lot of you know that I did that. Back in the spring, I published my first book. It's called Happy, What It Is and How to Find It. And, and so in the book, I, I talk about, and I spend a lot of time studying, what makes for a, a happy life. And, and if you go back and look at Scripture, that, that word happy, we often misunderstand. We think of it as just a feeling, you know, that comes and goes depending on whether or not things are, are going well or poorly in our life. And, and so happiness can change from day to day. But if you look at Scripture, the idea of happiness is often associated with this word shalom or peace. And happiness or joy or peace in the Bible is, is not something that's supposed to be dependent on the circumstances of our life. Scripture says that, that instead we can experience this deeper kind of joy, this deeper kind of happiness, this deeper kind of peace, a peace that surpasses understanding, a peace that we can experience even when things are difficult in our life, even when things aren't going as we expect them to go, even when the world or the events of our life disappoint us. See, peace, at least in the Bible, is not the idea necessarily that everything is okay or that everything is the way that it should be or that there are no problems or injustices in the world. While ultimately God will take care of that, Paul seems to indicate that we can experience a kind of peace even when things aren't going well in our lives. It's as if peace doesn't come because everything in our life is okay, but peace comes from the promise that God is present, that God is working, and that God and Jesus will eventually make things okay. And that might sound like a subtle shift, but it is a powerful shift to know that peace can come, not because everything's okay right now, but because there is a God who's coming. There's a God who's present. There's God who is at work. And there is a God who promises to one day make things okay. We can have peace now based on that promise. See, guys, I think there's a danger when we... <laughs> when we tie our sense of joy or happiness or peace to the circumstances of our life, not only at Christmas, but any time during the year. L let me use a, a metaphor. You know, about a year and a half ago, Jess and I did a lot of work to our house. We got a different house and we did some construction. And if any of you have ever lived through the chaos of, of construction, then you know that at some point you just pray for everything to get back to normal, where you don't have to fix anything, you don't have to put anything back together. And I remember thinking that. I remember thinking, I just can't wait. I will finally be able to relax. I'll finally be okay when this project is done. And of course, eventually the project got done. It was great, but it wasn't very long between, uh, between that project and, and something else going wrong, or something else coming up, or something else that needed to be fixed. And and pretty soon I realized, you realize this when you own a house, that, you, that you're never quite done. Things never are the, the way that you hoped they would be. If your sense of peace comes from everything in your house being perfect, then you're in for a long road. Well, it's not just true with a house, but it's true in our lives. When our sense of peace is tied to everything being the way we need it to be, everybody in our life acting the way we need them to act, and, and circumstances at work being okay, and, and finances always being strong, and us always feeling good in our life, if our sense of peace or happiness is tied to our circumstances, th then peace is going to be temporary and elusive at best. But instead, I think what, what Scripture is inviting us to do, what Christmas really invites us to do, is to find our peace elsewhere, to realize that peace, joy, and happiness doesn't come from everything happening the way we expect it to happen. Peace doesn't come when we're able to control things to be the way that we want them to be, but instead, peace comes from knowing that there is a God in Christ who is in control. And we can anchor our hope in Him 
and his ability to make things right in our life. I, I remember reading once a, a line that has always stuck with me, and the line said something like this, you can control the inputs in your life, but you can't control the outcomes. Think about that for just a second. You can control the inputs, but you can't control the outcomes. What, what I've always taken that to mean, I think what the author intended is, we, we can control what we do and what we contribute and what we try to accomplish, but we can't always control what happens. If, if, if peace in your life is dependent on controlling the outcomes, then peace is elusive and temporary. This isn't just true, by the way, with, with Christmas or annoying Christmas mishaps, but even in the midst of harder things in our life, there's a certain peace that comes from realizing that God is in control of the outcomes. I was talking to a friend recently, and, and this friend's a person of color, and, and, and that matters to the story because he's really involved in, um, in activist movements for justice, not only here, but even in other places around the country. And he works tirelessly. Uh, to see racial equality and justice uh, be a reality in places. And, and he was talking to me, and we were talking recently, and he was saying, you know, I just get so tired sometimes. Like, I work so hard, we do so many things, and it feels like we're taking a few steps forward, and then all of a sudden, we're knocked like two steps back. And he said, sometimes I just wonder if all the work's futile, and, and then I just remember <laughs> He said, then I just remember and find peace and strength in knowing that, that even if it doesn't look like we're accomplishing anything, I know that, that Jesus has got this, that Jesus is accomplishing something, that one day uh, this vision will be a reality. You know, I think that's the idea of peace that, that Christmas invites us to consider, that that we can try in our life, we can work in our life, and we can envision and dream and and fight for things in our life, but we get to control the inputs, but we can't control the outcomes. But the good news of Christmas is that you can't control it and you don't have to. But in Christ, the people of Israel saw a God who was coming to be present with them, who was there to work alongside them, and ultimately a God who was going to be able to accomplish what they couldn't accomplish. See, Jesus can accomplish what you can't. And Jesus can save what you can't save. And Jesus can control what you can't control. And knowing that and, and believing that can bring us a certain amount of peace. Going back to Christmas vacation, this is the way the movie ends. They're all standing on the front lawn. The cops have shown up. They've busted every window in Clark Griswold's house. And then finally, the sewer blows up. When the sewer blows up, his little decoration of Santa and the reindeer just goes blazing across the sky in, in, in fire. And the movie ends with all of them looking up. I mean, everything in his life has gone to ruin. Everything that he had planned for Christmas, you know, <laughs> just didn't turn out the way that he thought. But here's the ironic thing. It was like at the end of the movie, at the end of the scene, when everything else had fallen apart, um, it's as if Clark Griswold finally finds what he had been looking for. It's only at the end of the movie that he finally seems to have an authentic sense of joy or contentment or peace. It didn't come by things working out the way that he thought. It came when he finally let go of the control. Now, I hope things don't have to get that bad in your life for you to recognize where your peace can be found. But our peace this holiday, I think, our, our sense of contentment and joy and happiness isn't going to be found in everything turning out exactly the way that you want. And if that's where you're looking for, for peace, it's going to be a disappointment. But, in, but instead, our sense of joy, our sense of peace can come from trusting that, that the promise of Christmas is that there is a God who is present with you, that is working even if you can't see it, a God who can bring about good even when you can't. 
you know, I hate Christian cliches, and so I'm going to use one, and I just feel like I need to preface it. Like, this is a total bumper sticker Christian saying, but there's this saying that you've heard that says, let go and let God. And as cheesy and kind of generic as that saying is, I find that it's, it's also sometimes really true. And it's a reminder that a control freak like me needs, uh, especially around the holidays, And so this Christmas, I'm going to invite you to do something really simple. This Christmas, I just want to invite you to let go of something. To let go of your control of of, of something. And maybe, maybe you need to let go of your kids acting and reacting exactly the way that you want them to act. Maybe you need to let go of the need to have it all together this holiday. Maybe you need to let go of the expectations that you have of some people, the way that they'll be or the way that they'll act. Maybe you need to let go of of trying to make everything perfect. Maybe you need to let go this year of the need for people around you to feel a certain way or to experience a certain thing. Maybe you need to let go of your your own expectation that you're going to feel some particular thing. Maybe you need to let go of the sense that you have to be cheery and happy the entire time. Maybe you need to let go of the Christmas card being out on time. You can send it out afterwards. Maybe you need to let go of some of the control. Where's one place maybe where where you are banking a lot on an expectation and and you are trying hard to control it and maybe you just need to to let go. And, And when we do that, what I invite you to do is to remember that as we let go of control, the, the good news of Christmas is that while we aren't in control, there's a God who is. You know, Christmas calls Jesus a a savior and a king. And and what that means, quite plainly, is that Jesus comes to save and fix things that we can't save and fix. And that Jesus comes to rule so that we don't have to. That, That Jesus is in control and so we don't have to be. This Christmas, we can put our, our hope for happiness and peace in our ability to manufacture the perfect holiday, or we can realize that that even in the chaos, even in the imperfection, even in the mess, there is a God who is present at work and in control. And it's through that that Scripture invites us to find a peace that surpasses understanding. Let's pray. Gracious and, and holy God, we know our tendency to, in, in all areas of our life, at all times, try to manufacture and control things that ultimately we can't control. And uh, God, this Christmas, I, I pray that we could hear the, the good news, that Christ came to, to save us because we can't save ourselves. God, you came in Christ to be our king because we don't have the capacity to, to rule and control everything. And so, God, may... This Christmas be an exercise in letting go of some of our need for everything to be right or everything to be perfect or our need to control and instead to find um, a peace that comes from knowing that, that you are present with us. We pray that that kind of peace that surpasses understanding will be ours this Christmas and always. We pray this in the name of the one who came to bring us peace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.